Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Cancer Now What Vodcast, sponsored by Arizona Center for Cancer Care. My name is Jenny, and I'm very happy to be in studio today with two talented physicians in our community who focus on breast care. We have Dr. Angelist, who is a surgeon with Comprehensive Breast Center of Arizona, and we have Dr. Joseph Zachary, Southwest Breast and Aesthetics. Hi, Dr. Angelus. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for having me. Of course. So tell us a little bit about your specialty. You are a breast surgeon. Tell us what that means. Breast surgery is a division of general surgery in which we focus primarily on the treatment for breast diseases. Uh, Breast diseases can consist of anything from benign diseases to the breast, such as nipple discharge or pain, and um, extend to the treatment of malignant diseases or breast cancer. Why did you get into this specialty? I got into the specialty uh, when I did a breast surgery rotation at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is a world-renowned hospital in Manhattan during my general surgery residency. And I just really connected with the women. Um, I really thought it was um, great to kind of guide these women through a difficult time in their lives, knowing that they're going to be okay, because as uh, we all know, mostly breast cancer is caught very early and with proper treatment, then the outcomes are very, very good. Excellent. Well, thank you again for being here. Thank you. Dr. Zachary, welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks for having me. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your specialty in the breast reconstruction space and um, why you got into it? Sure. Uh, We do plastic surgery. We do the breast reconstruction after the mastectomy or a lumpectomy. Uh, The main thing that motivated me to be a reconstructive surgeon is my mom had breast cancer twice while I was growing up, and it was just kind of touching how the the surgeons take care of her and just experiencing that from the family standpoint. I just, you know, I always wanted to be a part of that care team. So it, this just was a natural fit. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so Dr. Angelus, walk us through a cancer diagnosis. Mm-hmm. When somebody is first diagnosed with breast cancer, at what point do they see you as the breast surgeon? And at what point do we introduce a reconstructive breast surgeon as well? Mm-hmm. So typically patients um, present as either an abnormal mammogram uh, during screening mammography or if they uh, have any changes, feel a lump in their breast or any changes at all to their breast. So we see them at any uh, range of the spectrum, being an abnormal mammogram, feeling a mass. Um, Typically after imaging, they do a biopsy. Uh, If it does confirm that it's cancer, then we sit down and talk with them and go over the the whole gamut of uh, treatment care and whether or not they need plastic surgery depends on which surgery they want, whether or not that's keeping your breast, doing a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. So if someone is diagnosed with cancer, let's say they just went and got their regular mammogram, right? Mm -hmm. And there was something detected on it. Mm -hmm. Is, is, is the person who like their primary care physician, the one that then will call you and, and say, I need you to see this patient? Um, it varies. There's some primary care specialties where they will work up the entire um, workup, including the imaging and the biopsy. Sometimes as soon as they feel a mass, they automatically refer the patients over to us. So um, we take these patients on at any point um, through their workup and just take over. But you're the first point of contact if there's a suspicion of cancer outside of the primary care space. Sure, yes. Okay, excellent. And then you bring in Dr. Zachary if there happens to be a need for reconstruction depending on the type of surgery that they have. Correct. So usually for breast cancer surgery, there's basically two options. One option is a lumpectomy where uh, you remove the cancer plus some normal tissue around it and keep the rest of the breast behind. And then um, the other option is for a mastectomy. Uh, Typically, some patients just choose to do a mastectomy, and if so, then we always give them the option of reconstruction. Uh, Sometimes, due to the extent of the patient's disease, they're they're not a candidate for a lumpectomy, so we do end up talking them through with the mastectomy, and again, including the plastic surgeons for their reconstructive options. And what do those options look like, Dr. Zachary? Sure. For post-mastectomy reconstruction, there's two worlds of reconstruction. There's implant-based reconstruction, and there's tissue-based reconstruction. Uh, With implant-based reconstruction, they're going to end up in a silicone gel implant for either one breast or both breasts, depending on whether it's a unilateral or bilateral mastectomy. And for a tissue base, the the same option exists. Either one breast or two breasts can be replaced with tissue. Um, With an implant-based reconstruction, um, they will have the option for immediate reconstruction at the time of mastectomy or a delayed reconstruction, and the same with tissue. 
they both have their pros and cons. So when you say tissue, you're taking the tissue from somewhere else on their body? Exactly. So how do you know where? So <laughs> we, the main thing is to find where the patient has an abundance of, of tissue that you can harvest with a vessel. The most common spot is the abdomen, and we call it a deep inferior epigastric perforator flap. We'll take that tissue and the blood vessel that supplies the tissue and under the microscope, hook that tissue up to live and replace the breast tissue that was taken. Um, if a patient has the skin and nipple left behind, we're replacing the gland. If some of those components were taken at the time of mastectomy, replace them as well. If they don't have a tummy or they've had a tummy tuck or uh, we look for other places such as the medial thighs or the upper buttock, but most patients have some area that tissue can be taken to replace the breast. As long as the tissue they have to give is equivalent to the breast volume that they desire to have after reconstruction, then almost all patients are candidates for tissue-based reconstruction. Excellent. Dr. Angelis, so when does chemo or radiation fit into a treatment plan for a breast cancer patient? Oh, I always give the analogy of, of treating breast cancer like going into war. Usually you have to attack the enemy at all different angles. So that's why we have soldiers in the air, soldiers on the on sea, and on land. Same thing goes with um, treatment for breast cancer. Uh, typically, surgery, again, is to remove the lesion. Um, and then you want to treat the rest of the area with radiation to kill off any cancer cells that we may not know about. And chemotherapy's job is to sweep through the whole body looking for any cancer cells, again, that may uh, that we don't know about that are circulating through the body. So it sounds like there's a team of physicians mm -hmm. for this type of cancer. Correct. How do you all communicate? You're not all in the same practice, you're community mm -hmm. physicians. How do you all um, make sure that you are talking about these patients and staying in touch? I know you see a lot of patients, mm -hmm. so how do you keep track with each other? We discuss cases through Tumor Board. Tumor Board is a meeting um, of the minds, if you will, and that calls in all the specialties um, for the breast cancer treatment. Uh, radiologists, pathologists, surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and plastic surgery. And um, it's through that time where we can collectively come up with a treatment plan, go over everything that uh, there may be questions about. And then tiger text. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of tiger text. Yeah, so tiger text is a HIPAA compliant texting um, platform, if you Correct. will. Correct. Yeah, so yeah. They, they text. I, I see you guys texting each other mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, so then what are the potential short-term and long-term effects of the surgery? Is there an impact on your mobility? And I'll, I'll point that one over to Dr. Zachary. We get patients of physical therapy because after a mastectomy, there can be a lot of guarding, decreased range of motion in the shoulder, mainly to protect themselves as opposed to um, a decreased mobility that is caused by the surgery. Uh, it's more of a response to the surgery. So uh, as long as patients go to physical therapy or do just kind of return their daily activities, there's no long-term um, decreased mobility that is from the surgery itself. Some of the sequelae of the surgery, some of the guarding or frozen shoulders that come up sometimes have to be involved other specialties to help uh, restore patients or kind of get them back to normal activities. But most patients bounce back with, with minimal uh, limitations. So um, explain that a little bit. What do you mean uh, they get frozen shoulder from the surgery? Like, can you expand on that yeah. a little bit? If you don't use your joint after a surgery, whether it's your knee, your ankle, your shoulder, and you kind of keep it immobilized, that joint will develop scar tissue that doesn't allow it to move very easily. So that when a patient has a mastectomy, if they in their minds are guarding that area because they say, well, I don't want to reach above my head or it hurts to do that, then they may develop a frozen shoulder that requires physical therapy. And sometimes if it's long enough that they're immobilized, um, you'll have to get orthopedics involved to remobilize that joint, to disrupt that scar tissue and allow the joint to move smooth as it did before. So really it depends on how much the patient gets up and walks around, is comfortable yeah. moving, you know, and, and, and gets back to normal life. Yeah, pain control is very important to address um, ahead of time at, in surgery and after surgery to allow patients to feel comfortable enough to do kind of the, the regular activities that they were before surgery and get back to normal things mm -hmm. as early as possible. Okay, and what about um, scarring? 
I know that now you can um, do tattooing for the nipples. There's things that you can do to really make the reconstruction look from a cosmetic standpoint, like the whole woman again. Yeah. Um, what give us some thoughts on that stuff? Absolutely. So whether you choose implant based or tissue based reconstruction, if you can't keep your nipple at the time of surgery, you can either have a nipple built um, during your revisionary plastic surgery or you can get a medical, medical tattoo by a medical tattoo artist or a combination in which you build the nipple and then tattoo it for pigmentation. There's also uh, tattoo artists which will do complete uh, tattoos across the breast, which are really nice uh, if patients want to do that. So whether you want to restore every component of the breast or you want to do something completely individualized, those options are there. Oh, like skin, you know, like moles or whatever it might be. When you say across all the breasts, um, some people will do a entire like tapestry across oh, their like breasts. Oh, like art. Yeah, to to almost reclaim that space oh, that for is themselves. So cool. And so rather than doing a pigmented areola, they'll do something with flowers, and they'll say, "Hey, this is mine," and it, you know, it's mine again. That's amazing. I love that. It's so empowering. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. And you you present all that to your patient when you have the initial consult yeah. with them? We or? tell them what's possible and we let them take that individual journey for them. That's amazing. Wonderful. Are there any short-term or long-term side effects from your perspective, Dr. Angelis, when you do the initial mastectomy? Um, typically, short-term complications include, again, scarring pain. Sometimes they could have buildup of fluid there, which usually resolves with time. Long-term effects are related to lymphedema. Uh, if we are uh, doing surgery in the axilla, uh, sometimes you disrupt that lymphatic drainage pattern, so they will have uh, lymphedema or lymph fluid accumulate in the arm. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. So how does somebody prepare for the surgery? Do, do they have to either dietary restrictions, medication adjustments, lifestyle changes? Like, what do you tell somebody before they go in for surgery? Mm -hmm. um, typically with medications, you usually need to stop all herbal supplements about two weeks prior to surgery. Uh, if patients are on blood thinners such as aspirin, Plavix, or Coumadin, that also needs to be stopped due to risk of bleeding during surgery. And also uh, the newer thing that's out there are those weight loss drugs, which slow the gut motility. So the, uh, medications such as Ozempic or Wegovy, we also are finding that we need to stop those about two weeks prior to surgery to prevent um, aspiration during the procedure. Oh, that's good information. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Anything um, else that you wanted to add on that? Uh, smoking, cigarette smoking, you have to stop at least six weeks prior. It doesn't allow the tissue to heal the same way. So in a reconstructive standpoint, you want everything to heal well, whether you have a silicone implant in there that's counting on that tissue to heal perfect um, to keep it in place uh, or you have tissue that you're putting together you you want to give it the best chance and you need at least six weeks without a single cigarette or a lifetime would be even better <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be a lot to ask for but, that'd be great. Uh, but at least the six weeks right. so um when can people expect to start feeling better after their surgery? When, you know, we, we talked about how there can be that frozen shoulder or there can be complications, but when can they feel like they can really get back to their normal lives? Yeah, I tell patients at six weeks, uh, you should be back to most daily activities, um, back to work, back to the things that, you know, brought you joy and feel that you're able to accomplish those things without limitations. We get them, all patients into physical therapy at three weeks to help kind of dial that back up so that we have a predictable timeline for the reconstruction and for them to return to normal life, which is the most important part of this whole thing is to be like, hey, let's put cancer in the rearview mirror and be able to go and live normal things and put a bad year behind. Absolutely. Agreed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, patients having a lumpectomy, typically the recovery process is a lot shorter. Um, usually patients are back to their normal day-to-day -day activities, basically the following day after surgery, but a full recovery as far as pain, um, mobility in their arm, probably about two to three weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are you excited about in cancer care? What's on the forefront? What are the advances right now? Mm -hmm. um, some advances that are coming across for breast surgeons are the notion of uh, over treatment and under treatment for uh, patients. Um, we, a lot of the times we're downstaging the axilla, meaning we don't need to do full axillary lymph node dissections as we once were doing in the past. There's more research that shows it's not um, 
improving outcomes. Um, it's also increasing their morbidity as in terms of development of lymphedema and with other adjuvant therapies such as chemotherapy and radiation therapy, uh, it's not needed. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're changing the way we do things mm -hmm. based on that research. Yes, less is definitely more these days. Excellent, that's great. And what about from a reconstructive perspective? For us, it's microsurgery. It's being able to do the microsurgery, offer you know patients that soft tissue reconstruction, especially with the changing landscape of treating cancer and the more use of radiation. Microsurgery takes advantage of the fact that you're bringing tissue from somewhere else and that you don't have the same effects that the radiation had uh, done on the breast to the tissue that you're bringing in. So knowing that the landscape is changing, but being able to have a technology where we're bringing tissue that still can have a great outcome is always going to be something that we view as cutting edge. And yeah. so we're, we're doing that now and Very that'll cool. be the future for a long time, um, especially now that the, the, uh, surgery is kind of guaranteed for uh, going forward. The reimbursement was in question. The coding was in question. As of two days ago, they said that, hey, tissue-based breast reconstructions could be supported for a long, long time. So that's, that's great. amazing. That's great. So not only, and that brings up a really good question because a lot of times when you bring in a plastic surgeon into a cancer case, plastic surgeons don't always get covered by insurance, right? But in this case, a lot of times, are you finding that commercial insurances will pay for the, the reconstructive service as well? Yeah, well, we had to sit with each commercial insurance to make sure that they covered their members and took care of the patients the way that we do. Um, and so all the patients that we take care of are you know, in network commercial plans. And if they aren't, then we get an exception because no one offers that service for the patient and they get treated as in network by their provider. There's very few commercial insurances that don't function that way. Uh, but we, you know, a lot of work that we did in our practice is to make sure that we can take care of all commercial plans with the exception of one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, that's, that's really good to know because I know people worry about how they're going to pay for their surgery. So right. that's really great. And I know you take all of the insurance plans pretty much available. <laughs> Correct. <Yes. laughs> okay, good. Well, Dr. Angelus, Dr. Zachary, thank you so much for taking some time today with me. Uh, I really appreciate um, your thoughts on this important topic, and I'm sure our audience will appreciate it as well. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. If you'd like more information on Dr. Janice Angelus, you can reach out to her at ArizonaCCC.com or azbreastcenter.com or 480 659 seven three eight four if you'd like more information on dr zachary you can reach out to him through his website at breastreconstructionaz.com 480-576-4310 thanks and we'll see you again soon